Hello, my night owls. Tonight I will be reviewing The Heidi Chronicles by Wendy Wasser? Wazer? One of the two. I'm not sure. I think it's Wasser. Don't quote me on that. Now, this was a very interesting play to read. Um, it, it's one of the first ones that I, I've read so far um, from the more contemporary, we'll call it, era that has such a fascinating heroine, at least to me personally. She's completely emotionally fragile, but she's so resilient while being fragile, if that makes any sense, which God knows whether it does or not. Ha. Um, we watch her make, when I was reading the play, I was reading what she was doing and I was sitting there going, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. That's going to lead you to hurt. That's a bad, that's a bad idea. Don't, don't do that. Don't be an idiot. And yet, I kept reading anyway, not only because I needed it for the grade, because I wanted to see if it was actually going to lead to heartbreak or if it was going to end up being good. I'll tell you what, it ends up being heartbreak for when she falls in love with the wrong guy. <coughs> Ahem. Anyway. But on the other hand, we also witness her learn from the mistakes of, like, falling in love with the wrong guy and the other choices she makes that we can all see will lead to heartbreak. And that in and of itself is incredibly, incredibly interesting to me because a lot of times we don't really get that level of character development. We see people make the same mistake over and over and over again. And sometimes that's how life is. But it's nice to have a change from that, if, if you catch my meaning. But uh, by the end of it, she proves that she's, you know, successful and what have you. And, you know, career and family life and all that. Sorry, um, one thing about this though, like looking at it from less of a theater standpoint, more of an English standpoint, is that it defines feminists of the 1970s as hardworking activists who forego gender expectations and they, uh, they want to improve women's status in society, which I think has been the whole thing the whole time, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, however, the ones, the younger ones portrayed uh, as being in their 20s during the 1980s are seen as more... I don't want to say it like this, but consumer-minded. It's, it's demonstrated that Heidi wants to develop a sitcom uh, with women Heidi's age. Well, no, sorry. Heidi's friends and Heidi want to develop a sitcom, which is great, because, you know, sitcoms are funny, everyone likes them, they're sort of like brainless TV you watch when you're sick or need something in the background while you're doing your work, but a lot of the other women Heidi's age are unhappy, frightened of getting old alone, and, you know, they're unfulfilled in life, because, you know, this is the fucking 1970s, think about when they grew up, oof, but the younger generation they're, they they want to get married in their 20s, have their first kid by 30, and work. They want to have a job. They want to make money. This is a disparity between the generations, and there's a really powerful monologue uh, by from Heidi in scene four, and there's one line that, oh, that got me when I read it, and it was, We are all concerned, intelligent, good women. It's just that I feel stranded. And I thought the whole point was that we wouldn't feel stranded. I thought the whole point was that we were all in this together. To me, it truly shows that she is, she feels, well, obviously she feels abandoned or else she wouldn't have said that. But it shows to me also that the generational disparity between, say, my generation and the generation before, or even the generation after me, the difference can be so great that we can have such different things in mind that we forget that we could accomplish everything each group wanted to do if we worked together. At least that's kind of what I got out of it, which is a sad truth of the modern day. Now, this play wasn't all good. There's no perfect play, not that I've found yet. Heidi, first man she falls in love with, his name is Scoop Rosenbaum. He is a complete and total jackass, there's no other way for me to put it any nicer than that. And Heidi spends 
decades of her life. I haven't even been around for two decades. This woman has spent decades, you know, having this man in her heart going, I love this man. I want to be with this man. This is my man. And it, and it, I, admittedly, I kind of see where she's coming from. Uh, I, I've done the same thing on a smaller scale myself, so I can't judge on that too harshly. But it, it does take away from her character a little bit, however it is human mistake, and it is, I feel like, realistically written, to, at least it would be for some people, you know. But uh, thankfully, one of her friends uh, snaps her out of it when it was Peter. Peter snaps her out of it when he asks her to contrast her misery with the more devastating issues going on around them. Peter, Peter's lost friends to AIDS. And uh, this gives Heidi a very much needed wake up call. And that was a really important part of the play to me because rationalizing your problems is something I struggle with myself and having someone there to just kind of be like, no, compare this to the other issues that are happening is a very helpful thing in keeping everything, you know, under wraps. But yeah, so th that's kind of, those were some of my thoughts on the play. Overall, I feel like this explores gender a lot more. It explores how it explores how the idea of gender when it comes to women is changing. And this makes it overall seem like it's changing for the better because Heidi is a very a very complex character. She's been very well developed. And I have a lot of thoughts on this. But real quick, I'll give you a rundown of the plot just to make sure that we've covered all the bases. And then we will say goodnight. So, it starts in 1989 with a lecture presented by he Heidi Holland. She's a lonely art historian. She focuses on developing stronger awareness of female painters, getting their work put in exhibits and otherwise male-centric museums, you know, that sort of thing. Essentially making space, which is an important part of any sort of like revolution or what have you. We jump backwards in the past, which is one of my favorite things it plays. I love time travel. Hi. Uh, and But we jump back to a 1965 version of Heidi. So this is, um, this is earlier. This is a lot earlier in her life. And she's the awkward wallflower at the high school dance. And, you know, we all know that. Hell, I was the awkward wallflower of my high school dances. You can bet your ass. But then she meets Peter at the high school dance, a larger-than-life young man who eventually does become her best friend and, as we mentioned before, snaps her out of her misery by saying, look at the fucking problems around you. Are you dying of AIDS? No, congrats. You're not doing too fucking bad. Then we jump ahead about four years to 1968. Heidi meets Scoop. Scoop is a jackass. Uh, he edits the left-wing newspaper and wins her heart. <laughs> and her virginity. <laughs> Not that there's a problem with that, just saying he's a bit of a jackass. After a 10 minute conversation, which, mm, Heidi girl. Heidi, I know it's a different time, but girl. Years go by, Heidi bonds with her friends in women's groups. She starts, she, she crafts a art career. She crafts a career as a historian and a professor of art. It's amazing. Her love life is, in, is a hot fucking mess. And like, who is it? But, she, uh, part of the reason her love life is much, which is not a problem I have, is that she has feelings for Peter, who is very, very gay. And these feelings are obviously not requited, which is a slight problem. But, of course, she can't, because of this, I feel like this could be part of the underlying cause of why she can't give up trying to get, trying to get with Scoop. Thinking Scoop's gonna be her ultimate. Scoop is gonna be, you know the one or whatever, and it's because she only likes two guys and one of them's gay, so that doesn't really work. But the other guy's a jackass, and apparently no other men exist. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Heidi wants men she can't have, or that she should really avoid. Personal experience tells you avoid scoop. Woof. And uh, she has she has dated other people. I forgot about this. She has dated other people, but they all border, so she ended up 
breaking up with them because you can't date someone you're not interested in. And I understand that. I, I very much understand that. <laughs> she, Heidi also wants motherhood and it becomes more painful after she goes to the baby shower. Mrs. Scoop Rosenbaum, that last name always fucks me up. Uh, yeah, so she has baby fever. But eventually she's empowered enough to find her own path without a husband, which is a good message and I'm here for it and I live for it. Um, oh yeah, a real quick side note on this. <laughs> Sidebar. Peter becomes a sperm donor and Heidi has a baby by the end of the play. And she doesn't have a husband. So she gets what she wants without marrying the jackass. And that just seems like a win to me. So, would I recommend this play? I say yes. Yes, I would recommend this play. It was a good read, and I will most likely be reading it again at some point when I have, you know, time. So that is all for tonight, my night owls. I'm sorry this episode ran a little bit long, but I had a lot of thoughts on this. So now I need you all to sleep tight. <laughs>